Well, again, welcome. You're here for the October 2022 United on the Fly monthly meeting. So tonight, you're two moderators. I'm Heather Hudson. I go by the pronoun she, her, hers. I live on the ancestral lands in Spokane, Washington, and I'm founder of United on the Fly and a, I'm an avid fly angler and I've never filleted a fish. So I'm really excited about tonight. My name is Priscilla Dorzinski. My, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I live in the Cheyenne and Arapaho ancestral land. I grew up in South Florida. So most of my initial angling experience was only keeping and harvesting a fish legally. We have limits down there as well. Um, so I have filleted a fish in the past, but I'm always open to learning new techniques. We again have five incredible women that are donating their time to be with us and share and give back to the community. And we can't say thank you enough to, to Patricia, to Liz, to Katie, to Sarah, and to Jay Michelle. Thank you all for being here and sharing. And we're all very excited to learn, learn from you all. So I'm going to pass this over to Priscilla. The smallmouth predation of salmonids can be pretty high. This citizen science project is a way for us to help collect some data to get some idea how damaging are the bass to salmonid populations, encouraging people to target bass and like eat them. And I want to tell you about some a smallmouth bass predation project that we're doing. So my work for Native Fish Society, as was mentioned, with Jay Michelle. I'm living on the past, present, and future homelands of the Atflati, Kalapuya, and Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. And I want to take a moment to, to acknowledge, too, that these uh, tribal members have really actively manage this this land for a long time. It's why we have the amazing fisheries that we do, the native fisheries that we do here. I'm really working with them more and more, particularly the Confederate Tribes of the Grand Ronde, to learn from them and also help support their conservation efforts. And actually this smallmouth bass project is kind of um, feeding in with some of the things that they're concerned about. So most of you are probably familiar with smallmouth bass are a really desirable um, sport species. Many of you probably fish for smallmouth bass and really enjoy it. And, and they might actually be struggling a little bit if you're in their native range to a certain extent. And so this map here shows in orange that kind of filled in orange area is the native range of smallmouth bass. And then those, those dots are showing every place where smallmouth have been captured. So this is from a USGS database. And you can see that they've been captured a, in a large area outside their native range, including even the Hawaiian Island, which is kind of I had no idea that that was the case and I don't enjoy seeing that. So while, while they're really a wonderful species in their own native range, as we often happens with some of these invasive species, they're not so great to have in introduced areas. This citizen science project is a way for us to help collect some data to get some idea how damaging are the bass to salmonid populations and where exactly in watersheds are they the biggest threat and at what temperatures do they start eating salmonids? When do they stop eating them in the fall? Are they actually higher active, higher in the watersheds than we think they are. And so this is from a study from 2006 in the Yakima River Basin in Washington State. I'm looking at smallmouth predation on salmonids. And so you can see this is over, you know, the course of a number of years. The, the smallmouth predation of salmonids can be pretty high in a watershed. This is, I think it's also interesting to note, this is in the you know late 90s, early aughts. And so when people were doing some, some bass predation studies in this time period in the Pacific Northwest, fisheries biologists weren't super concerned with what they were finding at the time um, because they're like, oh yeah, they're around, they're eating um, salmonids, but like not in like crazy numbers. And now, but we found with climate change in particular, um, that those are, that's starting to change a little bit. And so this is just a screenshot of a slide that Chris Lorian from OD, uh, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife presented before our Fish and Wildlife Commission in September of last year, um, that the Coquille River Chinook um, are doing really, really poorly. They dropped off really suddenly. So they went from being, you know, well in their kind of desired abundance to now being below, well below their critical abundance. So there's actually only like there were thousands before and now there's only like a couple hundred coming back and they've discovered that probably one of the biggest limiting factors in the watershed is a huge population of bass that's um that's growing and they're putting fishery restriction in place doing some of these other things to try to reduce harm to the chinook bass seem to be kind of a major limiting factor recovery of in those areas and so this is a photo that my colleague kirk blaine um who's a southern 
Oregon coordinator for Native Fish Society took. He actually went out with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife biologists and did some electrofishing of bass in the Coquille River. So that's when you put kind of electrodes in the water and it stuns the fish. It actually doesn't kill them and you net them. And then they processed all the fish and they looked at the stomach contents of the bass. And so this, you see, that's not actually a very big bass, right? But look at the salmonid, the juvenile salmonid that it ate. So that came out of its stomach. Probably well know if they can get their mouth around it, they'll eat it. They're probably what makes them fun to fish for, right? Is they're really aggressive. There's still a little bit of hesitancy. So, the, you know, there's a couple of places where bass are recognized as, as maybe being a threat to, to salmonids, but in a lot of other places, and probably because they're such a great sport, ODFW is hesitant to manage them as really an invasive species. They really still want to manage them as a, a sport fish or game. The Citizen Science Project is a way for us to help collect some data to get some idea how damaging are the bass to salmonid populations and where exactly in watersheds are they the biggest threat and at what temperatures do they start eating salmonids when do they stop eating them in the fall are they actually higher active higher in the watersheds than we think they are and so i came up with this project and, and we're focusing on a few different watersheds the reason we're focusing on these specific watersheds is because there's no limit on take on um, smallmouth in these watersheds so you can fish for bass all day long you can you can take a hundred home if you can catch that many, no limit. And so that what that is really good for us is from a scientific perspective, it allows us to then get a really good estimate of catch per unit effort. But it's, so if you had to, to limit your catch to, to say only three or five a day, then it's like, okay, it's hard for us to know then like how many fish are really out there. You Maybe you caught those in five minutes. <laughs> These are also watersheds where we're thinking there's probably... Ha- a large effect of bass on the salmonid population. So one is the Umpqua watershed here. I didn't have a great, I wasn't able to find a great map of the Malala Pudding River, but this is the the watershed that's closest to the Portland area. It's actually really convenient, also beautiful. Um, So that's one. And then the Deschutes, which probably actually most people are, the people on this call are maybe most familiar with, they've heard of the Deschutes. Um, and as far as the, the amazing steelhead that are found in the Deschutes, it's increasingly becoming known for bass, unfortunately, in the, especially in the lower Deschutes. And the John Day, and, the, and bass have been a problem in the John Day for a long time. Um, so these are basins that all you can catch as many fish as you want. Um, and, and so that'll really help us. And so we created this project on the, the Citizen Science SITSI platform that was created by Colorado State. State University. And it's a great platform because this is actually something to just share with all of you in general, in case you're interested in starting your own citizen science project, that this is a free application. It's a free platform. You can go on and just, you know, create a, a sign in and create project and, and have it create a data sheet. And then people can, can download the app and use it on their phone. And so you don't have to go out and pay a developer, you know, $10,000 to create your own app. So it's really great. If you want to find out more, it's kind of easier to read on the web version if you want to kind of look into the the background details of this. But really, you probably want to download it on your phone to collect the data. So it's available for Apple and Android. And I'm going to just kind of walk people through recording uh, data here. So you want to make sure (laughs) to register when you have cell reception. That might seem obvious, but you know, still want to check in on that. And then before you go, before you leave reception, this is really important. So this is a downside of this particular app is that will sometimes kind of unpredictably kick you off if you haven't used it recently. And so you want to make sure you check your login status before you leave reception, just to make sure you're still signed in. Because obviously, if you're out in the boonies, and you don't have reception, you're not going to be able to, to log in. So make sure you do that before you leave reception. Um, once you've registered and created an account, all you have to do is in the, the project search area here. If you just type in smallmouth, you will get, you'll find our project. We're the only smallmouth bass in science project currently. And so you'll get this smallmouth bass predation and you can just go ahead and click that button that says add data. And the first step will be to, to use your current location. So if you've got your phone, you can still have the GPS still function, even if your reception isn't working. And so just use that current location. It'll record that there. And then you can go ahead to the next step. And I'm asking people too to record the stream temperature, the time you spend fishing in minutes. Um, and the minimum is, is an hour, is 60 minutes. To get, again, to get an estimate of, we want people to be fishing long enough that we actually get a good estimate of how many fish are there for the effort spent. Um, and then ask how many smallmouth you caught. It'll go through the gape width for the smallmouth. And this is in millimeters. And so you'll need to take some sort of measuring device with 
with you that has metric. And the reason that I'm asking people to use millimeters is because this a down, another downside of this particular app is it only allows whole numbers. So if you're recording this in inches, that wouldn't be very good information, right? There's a huge difference between a gape size of two and a half inches versus three inches. Or I mean, like it would actually be two versus three. Whereas if you're measuring in millimeters, like if there's a difference of even a few millimeters, like that's that's fine, right? That's not a very big difference. Um, and so just to let you know what the gape measurement looks like, if you're kind of looking head on from the, from the bass, you want to open their mouth a little bit. And then at that widest point, kind of between their, their, their mouth there, you want to measure how wide that is. So that gives us an indication of kind of what size prey they can eat. And then we want the total length of the fish too. And so that's measuring kind of from the tip of the nose and then to the to the tips of the caudal fin. Thank you. Tail fin. So the two lobes, it can be sometimes it can be a little tricky. So if you if you kind of like smush them together a little bit, it, it'll it'll be easier to see where they line up. But so this picture is supposed to give you an idea of, of what that measurement is. And then after that, so the whole idea is that this is an invasive species. We're killing these fish. This is this is some lethal take, right? And so then you're gonna measure, also gonna take the stomach contents. I suggest wearing some gloves for this. <laughs> the stomach content. Um, and basically I'm asking people to record any native species they find. And, and well, and really not even native species, just any species that they find. So whether it's a salmonid, they'll also be eating sometimes amphibians. They can even eat small mammals or, you, you know, the sort of fly patterns that they go after, right? So <laughs> that represents some of the diversity they'll, they'll eat. So really anything that you find in their stomachs to go ahead and record. And then, so what I've created on this too, is that you see how there's this little plus button on each question where it asks for the individual measurements of the fish. So you'll need to click on that and then you can add the extra fish. You know, so if you caught three fish that then you'd, you'd fill out the, the, do the measurements for all the, the first fish and then go through and, and click those, add a, a new uh, observation for your next fish and go through and, and add all those. Otherwise you can't actually create a, a whole like observation for each fish. If, if you feel more comfortable and like doing that better, that's fine too. It'll be between your location, the time and everything like that. I'll be able to tell, you know, if, it, if it's from that same fishing powder. And then this is another really, really critical thing is that if you're, when you're out of service and, and doing this, you need to remember to, re to upload your data when you return to service. So it's no problem to record when you're out of service, store that on your phone. But then when you come back, um, you need to click on that sort of little hamburger menu there. And then it'll if you click on the ob observations to upload, it'll show you kind of all the observations when you're out of service and just, you know, go through and make sure that you upload all of those, those data. And so then we'll be able to take a look at that and get a better idea of, okay, so where are these fish? When are they eating the, the salmon? Um, when are they maybe eating other species? And then we can actually go that take that to managers and say like, Hey, you know, we really need to be considering controlling this small mouth in this watershed and in maybe a more aggressive way. So with that, I'll, I'll take any questions you have. Yeah. So I want to know Liz, what, um, like bringing it back to sort of a strategy around conservation, would, would you agree with the statement that sometimes taking and killing is, is a conservation? Yeah. I mean, it definitely is. And I think, you know, it, and it's a, I think in an invasive species like this, where, where it is a, almost a conservation thing to remove them, it also represents a really great way for people to connect to ecosystems in a different way, right? So, I mean, I'm hoping that people feel connected in a way that, you know, like they're actually feel empowered as science scientists, but also that it's like, okay, when you're actually eating your catch, like there's, there's something significant about that too, right? And Dr. Brick, and we had a couple of questions come in in the chat. Jennifer wants to know with this study, what sort of changes are you hoping to make to the regulation? So one of the things we're trying to push for with um, several tribal groups is to actually change the designation of smallmouth bass in Oregon from a game fish to a, a like a non-game fish. So currently you can fish for something like like um, large scale sucker, that's that's a native fish, but it's a non-game fish. Um, you don't have to actually have a license um, and you can actually waste those fish too. Like you can, you can just throw them on shore and there's no punishment for that. And so if they, you know, if, if bass aren't regulated that same way, then people actually, it's, it's kind of great that people who might need food could really use these bass um, as a food resource, basically, you know, more or less for free, um, just the, the cost of the gas to get out to get the mm -hmm. A question from Sherry, does the number of fish or the size matter more count, which is more... Um <laughs> 
Uh, it's probably the nu- the number ma- matters more, but you know, honestly, I think it really is actually almost the most interesting from a scientific perspective is is trying to catch fish when you wouldn't necessarily expect to catch fish, or like where you want where where you wouldn't expect to catch them. So where you think the limits of their range are, or like if it seems almost too cold, um, that's when it's really interesting, right? Because if you're able to catch them then and you see that they're actively feeding them, then that's that makes a different case because too, like one of the things that the the fish and wildlife departments have typically only looked at their predation kind of during the key months when like salmon are actively like the smolts are actually going out um, rather than like, you know, kind of like the rest. And Amber said, going back to the app and the citizen science um, project that you have on there going on right now, she doesn't usually target bass, but if she's fishing steelhead for say three hours and she swings up a bass, would she still record it as three hours of fishing? Um, Yeah. Yeah, I would. Because, you know, especially we are seeing, unfortunately, people, especially like in the lower to shoots are seeing that they're targeting steelhead, but, you know, because you're using things like streamers for steelhead, that's something that bass will often go after too. Too, right. So um, I think, you know, like that, that counts for sure. Does anyone want to get off mute and ask another question? And I did want to mention, we will be sharing the information for the app. I know Heather included it in the chat, but we're going to share that with an email as well to everyone that registered for, for the meeting. Awesome. I guess I, I, guess I have a question. Um, I've never extracted the um, contents of a fish's stomach and I've heard about people using like fish pumps or how would you that doesn't look like it would come out with a fish pump so how are you exactly extracting it and does it hurt the fish or am I still releasing bass you're you're killing the bass so that that's that's part of it is actually encouraging people to target bass and like eat them and the nice thing about these watersheds too is that um, they all have good water quality so that like, you, you know, like it's, it's safe to eat fish, um, like lots of fish that come out of these rivers. Um, so yeah, so if I'm, I've, you know, like puked fish before, so this is like cutthroat in their native range, um, where then you're kind of like tilting them upside down and you're forcing water into their stomach. And then they'll, it looks like they're throwing up like their, their stomach contents. That's not what you're doing here. You're actually just going to cut them open and take the stomach out and just cut this cut the stomach open and see what's in there so to make it easier too <laughs> i have a question um are there any other species besides salmon that are being affected the numbers by the bass yeah i mean so this is part of why i want to do this study too um is because in the pacific northwest the studies have really focused on salmon um and i'm kind of curious to see if there's other native species that are also being affected um, I would assume so. And I would assume almost, you might almost see more like um, red side shiner and speckled dace and some of those other, you know, small minnow native species um, to be more heavily affected too. They, they also often like slightly warmer water as well. So they're probably more likely to overlap with the bass. And like I said, so there's like red legged frogs that are native that are um, endangered um, bass could be eating those as well. So, you know, really just, you know, it, it, this is out of curiosity too, a little bit to see what diversity of, of things we're going to find in their stomach. Yeah. Yeah. Joanne wants to know what if we don't want to eat the bass, what do we do with the, (laughs) I've heard, I've heard. So Kirk, my colleague loves to put them in his garden for fertilizer. If you have a garden (laughs) or if you have a friend who gardens that they're, they're great fertilizer for like tomatoes and things like that. (laughs) You can also make them into pet food. There's recipes on the internet for homemade pet food for your cats and your dogs as well. Cool. <laughs> hey, this is uh, Mickey from uh, Lake Tahoe. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Did you know that there's bass in Lake Tahoe? I didn't know that, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> oh, I know. Near the, the key, mm-hmm. Cold Lake, there's an area that uh, bass got introduced. It's the freakest thing. Anyway, if I catch bass, do you want that information all the way from Lake Tahoe, California? You know, I have really been thinking of this as being kind of an Oregon initiative, but okay, I want not you know, I wouldn't say no. I wouldn't say no to data outside of Oregon either. Um, you know, if people are in Northern California, Washington, Idaho, um, Montana, and you are catching bass, it would still be interesting, I think, to, to take a look. I'll send it with a Christmas card. Peace. <laughs>
What is the range of this initiative? Yeah. So I think that 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 kind of ties back to the the last answer where it's, you know, if, if you're in a place where bass are invasive and I guess like my only, my only requirement is that you have to be fishing in a place where there's unlimited take on bass. And so that's, that's just, again, um, because we want to get that sort of estimate that the catch per unit effort. So how many fish you've caught over that period of time. Um, really gives us an indication of what the population density is like. Um, and so we don't want that to be biased in any way by um, there being a limit on tape. Cool. Yeah, that awesome. kind of goes back to what Katie just posted in the chat that they have smallmouth um, where she lives, but they're only in lakes and they're not allowed to harvest them. So it sounds like the rainbows are, are keeping them in check. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Perkin. We appreciate you being with us tonight. And thank you so much for all of that information. And like I mentioned, we're going to share the info for the app. So if anyone is already in Oregon or is visiting Oregon and you're going to be doing some fishing, then you can go ahead and download it and, and provide some of your some of your information as well. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle and I are just going to go over some of the harvesting questions. We put it up onto our Facebook page as well and ask some questions. So first question, Jay Michelle, in your humble opinion, what's the most humane way to kill a fish? So the most humane way to kill a fish if you go online and look, they'll talk about bleeding a fish out, which is a good thing to do, but I don't feel like that's the most humane way. It's the, the bashing of the head right above, and I'll show you where. Apparently, percussive stunning. Basically, if you go to where a fish's gill plate comes up to their top of their head, and then you see where their eyeball is, you come straight up to the point on their little head before their shoulders start. That's where their brain lives. Take a heavy object and you, you smack them on the head. We call things fish bunkers. People sell them. They're in cute little shapes of like baseball bat. You can use a, a heavy rock and then if or and or if you find yourself in an area where there's nothing to hit the fish with, you can actually take the fish and just do one smack against a rock or part of your boat that's hard. The key here, frankly, and again, this is about quickly ending the fish's life because we're going to enjoy and eat them. The key here is that you do it quickly and well. What you're looking for is either the eye to go dead. And by dead eye, I mean the eye, if you lift a fish, the eyes is always looking down, right? Because they're like, what the hell just happened? Why am I in the air? If you bonk them on the back of the head and it works, two things typically will happen. The eye will go uh, horizontal. It'll look like it's looking out at the horizon. That doesn't always happen, but it fairly, it does fairly often. But the real tell is the fish will shake, the whole body will shake, just like they do when they're spawn. So what after you hit that in that very specific spot of the head, if the fish shakes, you've done your job. Once a fish is, you've deceased the fish. Now the question becomes, what am I going to do with the fish? You deceased it, which in my world means you better eat it or give it to someone who will eat it, please. Thank you. It needs to be used for something. We're not just Typically, we're not just killing to kill. But so bleeding the fish. So you've, you've bumped the head of the fish. The fish is deceased. Now you're going to continue to fish, but you want your fish to be preserved. So you can use scissors, but I have just used my fingers, honestly. You just go into the gill plate and you yank down the gills. You know how we all practice studiously catch and release, and we avoid the gills at all costs because... If there's one little bit of blood from the gill, that fish is dead. Well, this is how to really quickly uh, decease the fish and move it onto another higher plane of existence. There's the main artery that is right underneath the gill. So if you just reach in on one side of the gill plate and yank it down, there'll be a freshet of blood and you've done your job. That will actually help also with the fish passing, keep the actual fish meat fresher for you when you go to uh, clean eventually and flip. Do you have to keep them on ice? Do you keep them in the water? It's the best way. And is there a time limit, you know, and getting them to a cooler in a freezer or? No, those are great questions. So I live in the Pacific Northwest and I fish a lot here on the West side of Washington. So keeping that in mind, if I'm catching larger trout and or sand or fish out of the saltwater, rockfish and such, as long as I've bonked them immediately and bled them immediately, they'll just sit at the bottom of the boat until I'm done fishing. And nothing nothing is going wrong there. I can keep a fish bled out and then uh, not cleaned, just deceased and bled out for you know, at 24 to 48 hours before it starts to deteriorate. Now, the maximum time on that is the 48 hours. Like, I, I wouldn't do that, and I wouldn't advise you to, but that's what the science tells us that I have this little graph for. So, ungutted on ice, so it's a whole fish. You've bled it, now you put it in the cooler. It can be, like, 24 to 36 hours. Bled, ungutted, 24 to 48. Gutted, 
wrapped on ice 72 hours to 120 hours, but that takes some doing and you're going to have to have a lot of ice, right? And that we're talking like I'm out somewhere in Florida, probably uh, doing some harvesting of fish and it's super hot. Ungutted, but refrigerated 24 hours to 36 hours, frozen and wrapped anywhere from three months. And then Amber has a great question. So she says, I've seen people cut the gills out and I've seen people just cut into the gills, slice them up and then massage the blood out into the river. Does it make a difference with the taste? As long as the blood's coming out of the fish, it's not going to affect the taste at all. Should you not bleed the fish, yeah, the blood will end up coagulating to the meat, and that is not taste. I've had really great luck in just doing that, uh, raking the gills really fast, and then just making sure that their heads pointed down towards the water. The blood comes out on its own fairly quickly. I've never had to, like, try and and, uh, make it bleed faster. We had this thing with South Dakota Game Fish and Parks this summer. We did a Catapalooza thing where we fished for catfish, and I've never had catfish before until this summer. And we had, they were showing everybody how to clean them, how to bleed them out. And some of them were not bled out, had them cooked right next to ones that had been bled out. And so we had the fish like side by side to be able to taste the difference. So we could see the difference in the fish itself and then also taste it. And it was a huge difference. And that catfish is actually delicious when it is bled out like that. It is really good. Real quick, the other thing I forgot to mention, Heather, that you had asked is transporting fish. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking about like being on the side of the river. Maybe I'm catching my limit. I'm keeping some on a on a stringer until like, but I go to the truck and now now what? So I, they sell fish bags. They're coolers, soft sided coolers in the shape of fish. Kind of, they're long and flat. You could put ice in there and put your fish in there. I use a trash bag, and I happily, <laughs> I uh, if I know I'm going for bigger fish, I'll I'll double bag my trash bag, but I'll put my fish in the trash bag, wrap it up, and then I just set a bag of ice on top, and, and that's perfect. And then I don't have to worry about the fact that potentially the fish is bigger than my little cooler or whatnot. Um, but that that is a great way to like transport your fish home or wherever you're going to continue to process. What about regulations? Mandatory catch and keep regulations. I know, J- Jay Michelle, you and I had talked about this. Too. Because at one point on the Grand Ronde in Washington, we had a mile stretch that if you caught a hatchery steelhead, you had to keep it. Yeah. So um, yeah. any any recommendations or suggestions for that? I work for an agency that sole purpose exists to try and bring back wild runs of fish. That is, that is what we do. That's why we exist. So I am always going to be a huge fan of removing fish that are planted or have arrived in ways that aren't natural and that are messing with, in my case, my salmon, trout, steelhead, Pacific land prey, that kind of thing. If there is catch and keep regulations in your area, I would investigate as to why that's true. I'm not a fan of blindly following just someone said, do it, so I'm doing it, but I want to know. And there's good science behind, behind it. Liz just described a great project in which they're trying to figure out if this is going to be a way that we can slow down the predation on our salmonids. So I'm a huge fan of the catch and keep. You're doing a, a service to other creatures there that are needing the help. And if even if you don't particularly like fish or want to eat fish, I totally understand that. But chances are there's someone in your community who does. And so call your local food bank, call if you've got local tribes, call them, talk about different ways that you can maybe go have super fun fishing and then y'all get to have a fish fry. Do you need to bleed a trout out even if you are going to gut it right away? I do anyway. Salmon have a lot of blood and that's what I really do, right? Salmon and saltwater fish, the bigger, they got a lot of blood going. Trout, depending on the size, trout can be big, they can have a lot of blood. I'm always a fan of ripping the gill if if the creature has one. Um, Because I just don't want to get home and have done all that work and have all that fun and then find out that my fish doesn't taste very good because I didn't hope, hope that helps and you're going to cut very not very deep because you don't want to puncture any of the organs so just very slowly all the way up until the gill plate so go in with a spoon because there's a little blood line that runs across the back of the fish on its spine and you want to pull that off too i'm katie i go by she her pronouns live in canada on Vancouver Island in a small little town. I've been fly fishing for about seven years, so I'm fairly new into it, but thankfully I do this all the time, so I've got a lot of knowledge over those years. So I'm going to talk to you guys about filleting fish and sort of just reiterate what uh, Jay Michelle said. So I actually brought a handy dandy tool. (laughs) 
<laughs> of the fish. So at least you guys get a visual of what even what Jay was sh- Michelle was talking about with um, the gills and everything like that. I've only ever harvested salmon. I haven't done trout or anything like that. So I can only equate to what I've done. Jay Michelle was saying was with the gill plate would be in this area. And so yeah, like she said, you would grab in there, pull down, bleed out your fish, which I... If I'm going to harvest fish, that's what I always do. And same thing, bonk on the head, make sure the eye goes dead, just like kind of like this, where it's just like (laughs) staring out into space. And so, and then also I always, me personally, I always pull the gill plate and I always got immediately. I've just always been taught that way. That way you have less cleanup when you get home. You just have to fillet it. You don't have to like pull the guts out and stuff. And then what I do after I pull the guts out, I throw it back in the river or in the ocean, wherever I am, because it actually gives a lot of nutrients to other little creatures that might be living there. So when it comes to actually like gutting your fish, you're going to want to work on the belly part. So we'll flip them upside down. (laughs) And so you want to start, you want to take off all the, all like the adipose fins, all the other little fins that get in the way. So you take all those off first, and then you're going to take a knife down at the anus here of the fish. And you're going to cut very, not very deep because you don't want to puncture any of the organs. So just very slowly all the way up until the gill plate. And then when you get there, you're going to want to take a cut that goes right across here. It's going to be hard. It's like cartilage, kind of where the gills are sitting attached to so once you get through that and then I usually I honestly just go with my fingers too as well and pull it out throw it out also go in with a spoon because there's a little bloodline that runs across the back of the fish on its spine and you want to pull that off too because you don't want like old blood sitting on your so no thank you so that's what I do to like get everything out and then when it actually comes to like cutting up your fish here in Canada we have to transport our fish with the head and the tail still intact. We can't cut it off and leave it at the river. It has to come home with you. In case you got stopped by conservation officers, they would know what species you two were taking home. So when I get home, and same with, sorry, what J. Michelle already said, I put mine into a trash bag or a fish bag as well on ice. Usually, depending how far I am from the river, I'll bring a cooler with me, but I might not always have ice. So I'll throw them in the cooler. And if I'm within a couple hour drive to a gas station where I can get ice, that's fine by me. I've never had an issue with my fish that way. Get home, clean it all. I usually start by filleting. So I have it on its side like so. And so you already have the cut down the belly from where you got. So I make another cut actually along the top part here all the way from the tail right to that gill plate bone that you would cut there and then I actually take off the head by that point because we don't need it anymore some people like the heads for fertilizer composting some people make broths out of them as well out of the fish bone so there's lots of uses for all the extras I keep the tail on because the tail is actually easy to hold on to while you're trying to flay everything so there's two different ways you can flay you can flay in like steak that would go this way or you can play and have like the long pieces that you generally see in restaurants and in the grocery store. So what I usually do is I cut down that spine. You already have the cut there. I make a cut on the tail and at the head. So what I do first, I start the thicker end and I'll take my fillet knife and get it right under there, right against the spine. And the, you'll feel the, the ribs in there as well. And I'll just, you want really sharp fillet knife and you get right under there. And then you just cut all across the rib until you get to there, cut it off that boom one fillet and then you turn it over and you're going to do the exact same thing that's it that's the best way i've learned to fillet a fish that's the easiest there's probably fancier ways of doing it but for me myself i find that's the easiest way and the best way i've learned how to do it but also there is parts on the fish here sort of in the tails bottom tails like their belly tails or fins i mean sorry belly fins you can actually keep those and barbecue they're so good So fish belly, really good. So don't don't always throw away the like the little scraps because you can use it for stuff as well. I also keep the tail and I'll actually barbecue it sometimes and I'll give it to my dogs. They love it. They love all the fins. I also, when I store it, I actually will store it in freezer bags. If you have a, one of those food saver vacuum seal things, perfect. That'll make your fish last way longer in the freezer. That fish doesn't last very long around in my household. So it's not in the freezer for very long. Also too, with the fish, after I've got it, let it out, everything, I'll actually stick the fish in the river with like a stick through its gill and just plunk it in the river. And it actually will stay until you're done fishing because the river is like quite cold then that's where it was living and if you're carrying knives and stuff like that for fishing definitely handy to have a first aid kit in your car or in your fly bag just in case Patricia has immersed herself in outdoor activities and launched Rivasista 
in 2021 to share her journey and inspire others. This incredible woman and all of these just incredible things that she's doing to get other women outdoors and to show she can have this travel trailer, she can fish, she can fish fry, she can fillet the fish. And it really has brought so many new women and so many just people into the sport. Really cool that Patricia has agreed to be a part of a part of our community tonight. And I hope you all follow her. You can find her on Instagram at Riva Sista and I'll make sure I put in her link tree too. So you can kind of see all the incredible stuff that she's doing, but she graciously did this whole video for us. So we're going to watch it. And she talks about descaling and flaying a couple of different ways. So let's, let's take a look. Hey, it's Patricia Clement, your river sister. And today I'm going to teach you how I fillet and butterfly fish. And I have a few more surprises. Today I'll be cleaning a spot and a gray trout. These are the items you'll need. You can use a fork, a knife, or a scaling tool. Here I'll demonstrate all three methods. The first thing I do is remove the scales. An easy way to know which way to stroke is to remove scales in the direction away from the tail. My preference is a knife. When using a knife or any other scaling tool, be sure to rotate so you can get under the bottom and rotate on the top so you can get next to his fin. Flip it over and do it again. So right here, you'll see a little dot and inside of that dot is some waste. We all know what that part of the fish is called. Um, so here I just cut it and I'm going to remove the waste. Here I'm cutting the head. And if you notice, I'm going to do a slight little curve before I get down to the bottom. So now it's time to butterfly. So right above the tail, I stick my knife in until I feel the bone. And what I'm going to do is carefully slide my knife. I'm going to make a slit and carefully go all the way up his body alongside that bone. And take your time doing this. Be sure to be careful. Once I made that slit, I'm making slices right along that bone until I can get that fish to lay open flat like a butterfly. Once it's laid open, I'm cleaning off the sides. You can look and tell what shouldn't be there. Here's a butterfly. That's how I butterfly fish. I'm not a pro. I'm just teaching you what I know. Removing the rib cage bones are optional. If you decide to move them, I'm putting my knife right under the line of bones and I'm cutting just beneath the bones not to cut the meat but just to get the bone off so it's very thin see
this spot has already been the scale now it's time to fillet so just behind his side fin I'm cutting down and then I'm gonna put my knife on an angle and run it towards the tail along his bone with bigger fish when I get to the bottom I flip that fillet over and then I run up the side and take the skin off but for this video since this fish is smaller I went ahead and cut the whole fillet off and now I'm taking off that rib cage it's a very thin line of bones and all you need to do is put your knife right underneath the bones here it is again I slice down then I turn my knife towards his tail and glide the knife down removing the fillet once again I'm removing that thin rib bone skin on or skin off that is the question I like mine both ways so now I'm going to show you how I take the skin off of a fillet so what I did was lay the piece of fish down flat and I'm running my knife flat along my cutting board every once in a while I'll grab the skin and I'm kind of pulling it so my knife can glide down that nice fillet nice and easy voila look at that isn't she pretty now I'm gonna clean a gray trout also known as a weak fish in Virginia we can keep them at 12 inches this one was a little over 13 so what I'm doing here is I'm using my scaling tool to descale and remember to remove the scales you stroke away from the tail remember when descaling your fish be sure to rotate your fish so you can get every nook and cranny and remove all of those scales most of my fish all the same once I cut down I put my knife on the angle and I just glide along that bone till I get down to the tail again sometime when I get to the tail I flip it and then I go run down the meat again separating the meat from the skin and sometime I'll just cut it all off So here I'm taking the skin off and remember my knife is flush with my cutting board. Sometimes midway through filleting I have to lift my meat up to get a better grip of the skin. that nice fillet y'all should be hungry now one thing I forgot on a spot fillet is right down the middle there's a little line of bones and sometimes I'll cut that in a V and you can get those bones out but wait there's more there's no way I could teach you how to fillet fish and not teach you how to fry it my fried fish tastes so good here's how I do it first I rinse my fish just with water 
I'm only frying a small batch for me. Next, I heat up the grease. I use peanut oil. You can use any oil of your choice. I sprinkle some Tony C's on my fish. It's my favorite. It's a Louisiana all-purpose Cajun seasoning. Next, it's time for the batter. I use house oil treat medium hot. It's already seasoned, so you really don't need a lot of seasoning. How much you put is totally up to you. I use Tony's with no salt. And here's just a quick look at how much season I put on my fish. If you never use egg and mustard to fry your fish, oh my God, you have been missing out. So what I do is just crack one egg and I squirt some mustard in there and then you beat it. Next, I take my fillets and dip it in that mustard egg wash, or you can pour it in, either or. Swish it around so the egg gets on every piece of the fish. Now it's time to drop it in some hot grease. So I splash water or something in there just to make sure that it sizzles and it does. So next I'm going to take my fish and coat it in that house tree. Some people use a plastic bag. Some people use a Ziploc bag. And you can also use a microwave plastic container or bowl. But what you want to do is put it in there and shake it up so it's coated evenly. Fish cooks fast, so when I'm heating the grease up, my grease is my fire is usually high. But once I put my fish in, I turn it down like to medium. You'll know when it's done because it's going to be golden brown and it's going to rise up to the top. It'll float to the top of your grease. Once it's golden brown and floats to the top, remove it with a strainer and you can set it on a paper towel to catch the grease. Those are two fillets. The next piece I'm going to show you is one of the fish that I butterflied. And as you can see, she's golden brown and floats to the top. Now she's ready to come out. But wait, there's more. Fish and grits is an easy meal you can have for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Somebody's probably saying, yup, fish and grits, but please don't knock it until you try it. The secret to good grits with your fish is instead of using water, use chicken broth. Thank me later. Be sure to stir your grits so you don't have big lumps in them. You can also add milk, heavy whipping cream, or half and half to make them extra creamy. I also like to top my grits off with cheese when they're done. Oh my God, it is so delicious. Okay, now it's time to eat. Will you look at these fish and grits? It is so good. And I'm not just saying that because I made it. So once you make your fish and grits, please tag me. I hope your plate looks like this. I hope you enjoyed this video. Have a great day. I am a ball of energy. I'm like this all the time. <laughs> early bird um, I had so much fun making that video I love original content I like to know what people want and like give them exactly what they want so I also want to know please tell me in the chat who's going to make some fish and grits you got to try it <laughs> yes if you, if you do follow me on social media you'll see that today I caught 
Oh, I caught the catch of my life. I caught an alligator guard. It was about three feet. I, I never scream. Like when I take women fishing, they scream. I'm like, what are you screaming for? Like screaming is not going to change anything. And I, I went against my own rule today and I screamed. <laughs> Oh, that's so congratulations. That's awesome. Appreciative that you're a part of a part of this and a part of our community. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm reading the chats. I see people are saying mustard. Yeah. Egg and mustard is the trick. I cannot fry fish without egg and mustard. It's really good. And chicken broth for grits. Yeah. Chicken broth for grits. It gives it such a good flavor. I just can't wait for y'all to try it. Y'all gonna be like, I should have been doing this. Eating the fish has been part of my life since I was a kid. So I tried to include rest for pretty much all the cooking methods, your air fryer, pan frying, deep frying, black stones, triggers. It's all on. I use them all. The cool thing about fish is there's so many different ways to cook it. Hi, and Sarah. I am from Pierce, South Dakota, and we are in the middle of nowhere. And there's basically three reasons why anybody lives here and that state government or the state capital, even though we don't even have a target, fishing and hunting. So we have the Missouri River right in our backyard and Lake Oahe. So that provides salmon, smallmouth, largemouth, walleye, bluegill, crappie. We have awesome fishing here. So I'm very thankful to have grown up eating fish. My dad taught me to fish probably when I was 10 years old. I uh, didn't start fly fishing until about four years ago though. So most of it has been spent fishing, but eating the fish has been part of my life since I was a kid. One of the ways that my mom always made fish and it's super simple. It doesn't even involve eggs or anything. You just literally dip your fish in some flour and whatever seasoning you want. So I liked equal parts of garlic, salt, and lemon pepper and put flour in there. You don't even have to, you can just season your fish. That's the cool thing about fish is there's so many different ways to cook it. And it, I know people get frustrated when somebody tells them I don't measure, just do what you like, but it really is what you like. And you're going to have to figure that out. But that's the cool thing with this is it's so flexible. You can, there's so many off, but this is what I like to use. And so use it as a starting point and then just go from there. And that's the thing. I'm a foodie. So I like to cook and I like to have kitchen gadgets. And so I tried to include rest for pretty much all the cooking methods, your air fryer, pan frying, deep frying, black stones, triggers. It's all on. I use them all. Um, Let's see. So this one, this is the most simple way to do it is just coat your fish in a little bit of oil and then season it. You don't use any flour or anything and then you can pan fry it in butter. The fish that I eat typically is walleye and you don't really want to cover up the flavor of that fish because it's just incomparable to any other fish. It's amazing but it's really delicate and so I use just a little bit of seasoning and a little bit of lemon. Elton Brown has got an awesome beer blanc sauce. Sounds fancy but it's really just butter and cream and some citrus which is amazing and I highly highly recommend you try this um blackened fish and I didn't put like what kind of fish this is for because like the blackened seasoning is on salmon you can use it on the white fish on pretty much everything and the cooking method here works for pretty much all the different kinds of fish as well and don't get intimidated don't come in here and say oh this has time in it i don't like it i'm not gonna try it if you don't like one of these leave it out because you don't have to use any of it this is what i like the air fryer is one of my app favorite ways to cook fish i have my air fryer that sits on my counter and i use it almost on a daily basis and i eat fish probably three times a week just because it's here in my backyard and i catch it all the air frying fish so easy and so quick really there's it takes 20 minutes and you have an amazing meal and you can cook your vegetables and everything right there in your air fryer. So it's quick meal. Being from South Dakota, one of our most popular things to do in the summertime is to go camping and we have fish fry. And so I included some of my batters. Hers are absolutely amazing and I cannot wait to try Patricia's. I have never heard of the mustard thing, but I'm excited to try it. So here's a couple other ones. There's a beer batter and here's a dry batter that and it's amazing. The key here with these, I like to sprinkle Lowry's garlic salt on it as soon as it comes out of the fryer. It makes it ugh, amazing. Just have to try it. Here's the Traeger recipe. And I included the link of where I got this recipe and I don't change it. I love it the way it is. It's perfect. It's delicious. Quick. If you want to impress somebody, I would say try this recipe. This pecan honey walleye. Pretty amazing. It, uh, I can't even, I kind of want to go make this now. But this is probably one of my top three recipes and people always just love this when I make it for them. This Creole fish is probably one of my 
other favorite ones. And I know in the culinary world, it's kind of taboo to use these with food, but it is amazing on this dish. And I typically use perch um, is my fish that I like to use in this recipe, but it works with any of them as well. And I know here's another one, which, but this is a dip and it is really good to take to a social party or whatever. People can't believe that I put walleye in a dip, but I do. And it's amazing. So these are the recipes that I shared. I have so many that I could share. I could probably do a whole book, but my problem is I don't measure. It's all about looking and how things, and this should get you started. I mean, don't be intimidated. It's so good. And I hope you guys try everything. Again, thank you all tonight so much for being here, being a part of the community. And again, a huge thanks to all of our presenters and to our Zoom moderators. So Priscilla, thank you. Thank you so much to Liz. Thank you, Jay Michelle. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Sarah. What a great presentation. This was a lot of fun. I learned so much. <laughs> and it's different, which I like too. You know, it's pretty cool to learn new things and see and and just be different be di being different is good <laughs>